In this chapter, I want to talk a little bit about capital markets and the pricing of risk. Sounds like a pretty fancy uh, term, but essentially what we want to do is we want to talk about the concept of risk and we want to look at what the markets are currently doing relative to pricing. That is, if you're investing in risky things, how do you get paid? How, how do we determine what that level is or what should that level be? So as we work our way through here, we're going to talk a little bit about some statistics. Uh, we're going to talk about calculating returns, calculating the statistics of both individual assets and portfolios. And we'll talk a little bit about the concept of risk, its components, and how it could ultimately affect um, our investing decisions. So let's start with a question. So let's look at the last 89 years of investing. If you would have invested $100 89 years ago and you had five things to choose from, what would those earnings look like today? So our graph here, if we can make it just a wee, maybe a little bit bigger so you can see it on the screen here. If you look, the very bottom line here, CPI, that's the consumer price index, that's inflation. So $100 in 1925, in today's money, that would be $1,312. So said slightly differently, $1,312 today will buy what $100 bought in 1925. So what's the rate of return on these investments? And you can do the calculation. The present value is zero, is 100. The time frame is 88 years. And then you just pick these N values. So if you look at small stocks, small stocks would have grown to $4.6 million. What is that rate of return since 1925? So if you calculate that rate of return, it's roughly 12.99%. Almost 13% is what small stocks have earned. What about the S&P 500? That's this blue mark. It's substantially less in value in total. And in the end, the rate of return is about 10.1%. So the S&P 500, our stock market, appears to grow on average around 10% on average per year. Small stocks have higher long-term returns than uh, long-term stocks. T-bills have the lowest long-term returns. We also find, if you just look at the picture, you could see that small stocks also seem to have the greatest amount of variation and flex, uh, uh, volatility in the numbers. So it appears that higher risk things ultimately pay and or require higher returns. Now it really depends on the time frame you look at. I mean, if you look at these same statistics over uh, different time frames, right? Here's after 10 years, the value after a year, you know, from 1925 to 2010, one-year returns were different. What about 20-year returns? We can see that depending on your time frame and when you start investing, we can also see that there's a lot of differences in volatility. So that's what we want to talk about in the next section of these videos. We want to talk about risk, right? What happens to returns? How can you deal with the risk concept and how do we apply it when we think about investing? So the first thing we need to think about are some probability distributions. Essentially what we're asking is, what is the chance that a certain event will happen in the future? If investments are risky, then in different time frames, right, over different periods based on different 
possibly economic events, they will have differing levels of returns. So for instance, let's assume that you currently have a stock that trades for $50. In next year, you think there's a 35% chance that that stock could go to $80. A 50% chance that could stay at 60, and then a 15% chance that would actually go to $35. So we looked at a table you see what? Here's the $50. If the price goes from 50 to 80, that is a 60% rate of return. 50 to 35 is a negative 30% return. And the probabilities represent the chances that these events will happen. So from this distribution of returns, we want to talk about how we measure risk. There are three basic statistics that we want to talk about. The first is the expected or the average return. This is the mean. Essentially, we're talking about a normal distribution of returns. To find the expected return, you need to find the probability times each return, and then you add those all up. Now, you can do this by hand. It's rather time consuming. Certainly, it's not difficult if you have uh, a computer and you can use a spreadsheet. Variance and standard deviation are the same term. Standard deviation is just the square root of variance. If you think of what variance is, the calculation says, look, you expect to get this expected return. That's what you expect to get. R is what you could get in a certain event. So there is a difference between what you think you'll get and what the average is. So this is the difference from the expected. Probability then talks about what's the chance that this difference will occur. So a very good definition of risk is it's the chance that you don't get what you expect to receive. To find the standard deviation, you take the square root of this summation. So in finance, the standard deviation of a return is also referred to as its volatility. Standard deviation is a little bit easier to interpret because it is in the same units, if you will, as returns. Right? Variance, you're squaring these uh, returns. So it's the, the correct label here is uh, uh, percent squared, and such a thing doesn't exist. When you take the square root, it puts it in the same um, units, if you will, as what returns are. So here is our example for these returns. Here are the probabilities. This is done in what's referred to as the standalone risk worksheet. You input the probabilities, you input the returns. Down below here, the expected return of this asset is 26.5%. The standard deviation or the risk of this asset is 29.88%. Now, all by itself, it really doesn't mean anything. We have to kind of understand what we're talking about when we measure risk. The bigger the number, the greater the risk of the asset. Now, if you want to make comparisons, quite frankly, the best way to compare is with this statistic called the coefficient of variation. That's 1.13. And again, the bigger the number, the greater the relative riskiness of this asset is. We can look at range. Range isn't a, a very sophisticated statistic, but it's just the high minus the low. So 60 minus a negative 30 is 90%. Again, it doesn't take into the prob, uh, account the probabilities that these events all, uh, ultimately happen. We'll talk a little bit later about confidence intervals, but again, this just measures there's a 95% chance that this return is between negative 32 and 
and I think you might agree that that's a fairly high um, interval, right? That's a very big interval. So there's lots of opportunities for things to happen between the highest and lowest outcome. When you think about historical returns, especially if we're thinking about a stock, we can divide it into some parts. You can divide it into the dividend component and the capital gains component. So this is actually pretty easy to do with stocks. Since we essentially know what the prices are, we can calculate what we think the dividend yield is or the return that you get from the dividend piece. That's just the expected dividend divided by today's price. And then the capital gain then is the dividend minus the end price divided by the current price. So essentially we end up with is dividend yield plus capital gains rate. We can do the exact same things with historical returns. Again, if we understand that we have a series of prices, you can calculate the rate of return per period. Of course, if there are cash flows that are paid in the meantime, we do have to take into account that there are, that there are dividends that are paid that might have to be incorporated in our overall returns. So here we have a graph that represents the S&P 500 from 2015, this is the index. And if you go down the list here, you can see that here is the actual index's value. And now the dividends, these are the dividends that were paid on the stocks that were in this dividend. So you can calculate the rate of return per year on the S&P 500. I'll show you how that's done here in a brief second. We also can calculate the same things for Microsoft. In this case, we might assume that Microsoft is not paying dividends during this time frame. And you can also calculate the yields or find the yields on one month treasury bills during this time frame. So how we can calculate the returns is by using something called the holding period return. And there's a worksheet for this. So essentially you start with the beginning value. We need the ending value and any cash flow. And of course the time frame. So in this time frame, this is a one year period. So the 2002 statistic back here, it's 1148 is the beginning, 879 is the end. So it's 879 plus the dividends divided by the beginning so year one here in 2002, the rate of return was a negative 22%. In 2009, it's around 26.5%. So again, we can calculate using this holding period return, we can calculate annual returns. Now you could also do the exact same thing, but what if we wanted to find the return from 2002 to 2009? In the end, you would put this ending value 11.15.10. The beginning value would be the 11.48.08. And the cash flows would be the sum of all the cash flows between 2002 to 2009. So again, we can accommodate different time frames. What you would have to do, though, is type in here the investment time. So it was 2009 to 2002. If you subtract those two numbers, the investment time would be seven periods. That would give us the average rate of return over those seven years. There is another spreadsheet that we could use that's called the Historical Data Returns Worksheet. In this case, we want to include or incorporate all the returns of the assets for in this case there were 13 years and again this just comes from the statements asset a here is microsoft asset b is the t-bill 
and then the market returns here. This is the S&P 500's returns that we uh, received or got from that, that table. So it turns out that Microsoft earned an average of 8.6% and the market itself was 8.65. So 8.61 versus 8.65. But look at the differences in risk, right? The coefficient of variation is 4.1 for Microsoft, but it's 2.94 for the stock market. So even though the stock market earned a very similar return, in fact, a smidgen higher, it also had almost half the risk, certainly 25% less risk than what the marketplace had. We can also incorporate this data into uh, forecasts of the future. So we can plug this into some um, worksheets and we can calculate and predict future rates of returns based on this historical data. So what does the real world look like? If you look at these four basic kinds of securities, you will, you can invest in the government and treasury bills, very short term. Corporate bonds are long term, but corporate debt, S&P 500 are the 500 largest stocks, and then small stocks, I'm not sure how they definition or how they define small stocks, but realize that there are obviously very small companies that trade publicly. And what we find here as you move up the table, you get to higher and higher rates of return. So from 1926 to 2014, the S&P 500 averaged around 12%. At the exact same time, the standard deviation of the S&P 500 was 20%. Now what you can see is relative to the S&P 500, returns are lower down below and they have lower risk. Returns are higher for small stocks, but it also has higher levels of risk. So it appears from the real data that we can see that there is an, as rates of return increase, those stocks, those securities are representing higher levels of risk. So let's talk a little bit about standard error. Since we're looking at historic data, we have to be concerned with what's referred to as statistical error. As we add more and more things, as we utilize information, that information loses some of its importance, if you will. So the standard deviation is a statistical measure of the estimate of error of an asset. So the standard deviation, right, that we're talking about here, the standard error, you take the standard deviation of the asset and you divide it by the square root of the number of observations. This gives us a picture or a measure, if you will, of what the degree of estimation error is for a standard deviation. So the 95% confidence level is a historical average rate of return plus or minus two times that standard error. So if we look at the data that we had, we can see that 12% was the average rate of return for the stock or for the S&P 500. Standard deviation was 20.1%. So the actual standard 95% er, uh, confidence interval is 12% plus or minus 4.3%. So from this estimation or from this calculation, we could say that next year we would expect the next year's rate of return to be between 7.7% .7 and 16.3%, and we're 95% sure that that is going to happen. If you kind of think about this being a distance, that the distance of the standard error here is 4.3%, the greater that distance, the greater the opportunity, or the greater the volatility of potential outcomes. 
if this were if the standard error were 10 then we would say we're 95 percent sure that it goes from two percent to 22 percent and as this range gets bigger and bigger i think you can imagine that there are more things that can happen between the endpoints and again that uh, going back to a previous definition that i had mentioned it's the probability risk is the probability that what you think is going to happen doesn't happen so that's the end of part one of this pricing of risk uh, topic